Hey everyone, welcome to The Sword and Laser, episode number 192. I'm Veronica Belmont. I'm Tom Merritt. Welcome to the show. Right now we are having a live Google Hangout with a fantastic author, Robert Jackson Bennett. Thank you so much for being on the show with us. Sure, thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, Robert is the author of City of Stairs. It came out September 9th. It tells the tale of the city of Bulakov. Is that how I say that? Yep. Okay, that Bulakov once wielded the power of the gods to conquer the world, enslaving and brutalizing millions. And as these things happen, it's now just another colonial outpost. However, is it really? That's the question. Into the broken city steps Shara Thivani? Yep, there you go. Yeah. I'm nailing it. Uh, she's just an unassuming young woman, just another young diplomat, or is she? Uh, that's the sort of the kind of thing you'll find out if you read City of Stairs, which you should. Uh, anything to add to that description? What else should we know if we're looking at this book? Uh, I think there's a line at the end that's very suspenseful about how she's not convinced that all the gods are dead. Mm. And there's a big dramatic question mark at the end there. And that's not saying too much to tell people that. Not saying too much. I don't think so. No. Oh, good. That that means that there's even more in there, folks. Uh, yeah. To... A lot more. So, uh, tell us a little more about uh, what led you to City of the Stairs. This is not your first book, right? No, this is my fifth book. Uh, it was um, one of those ideas that comes all at once. I told this story a few times, but um, and so I'm trying to find a way to put it that's uh, clever. Is that um. Because it's actually kind of silly. I was at home and I was uh, uh, just cleaning the house, and I was thinking uh, about writing. And uh, usually, all my all of the best ideas that I have occur when I'm uh, mopping, when I'm doing laundry, things like that. And um, there was uh, uh, on the TV uh, in the background it was the old movie channel, and there was this um, old film from the early '30s about a, an English tourist that goes to a small uh, a, a, a fictional uh, country in Eastern Europe and gets uh, mistaken for a king there. And I suddenly thought it must be really hard to deal with the this sort of like region with all these tiny countries and all these tiny kings and these rules. And I suddenly thought about how hard it would be to uh, be a diplomat there. And as soon as I thought that, I thought I want to write that story about someone who is a diplomat in this region and has to be, you know, polite and has to say all the right things and at the same time make sure that all of their policy gets pursued. Um, and once I thought that, I kind of thought, what would be the most uh, most most interesting uh, a person to send there that would clash so well with this? And the idea that I had was uh, a young Southeast Asian, uh, a, a woman who was quite bookish and smart and clever. I thought that she would clash extremely well with this very old guard, big mustaches, frowny sorts of men. And I kind of wondered to myself, they don't like her. I mean, that has to be the reason. I mean, like, uh, that has to be the state of things, is that they don't like her very much. But why don't they like her? And then suddenly I thought to myself, because her country killed all of their gods. And once I thought that, I was like, that's really interesting. And um, I think I had that idea in early 2012 or so. And it just kind of sat in the back of my head. And uh, as time, it's sort of, as time passed by, it's sort of, I guess, like a like a crude in my brain until finally I started writing it. And that was the first time that I ever thought about or chose to write a, a secondary world fantasy. Wow, that's that's uh, that's one of the best uh, I think origin stories I've heard for a book in a really long time. That's that that was pretty in depth. I love it. Um, so, what about this character? Do you think people are going to relate to? Is she is she fiery? What's what's her? As a woman, I love hearing about strong female characters, especially in in the leading role. Well, when I first started to write her, um, the main inspiration was George Smiley, who is the uh, the protagonist of the John Le Carre books. And he is, uh, he was written, you know, back in the 60s and 70s at the height of all the James Bond stuff. And he is the anti-James Bond. He is about 60 years old. He's short. He's fat. He has big, thick glasses. And his wife has been cheating on him for like 10 or 12 years or so. And, um, but he is an excellent, excellent spy. And uh, what's really fun about him is that what makes him good, well, there's a lot of types of spies in the world, but some of the ones that are the most important are the ones who sit in an office and read a lot of reports and think very hard about them and talk amongst their peers. And he's the Mycrofts, really. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's what he's built as. But what's really 
fun about him is that he wins because he is an extremely compassionate person. He understands what people want and what they want to do. So when I first thought about how I wanted to write her, I um, I kind of followed that line. Like she, I don't think she ever holds a weapon in the book at all. Uh, she has an extremely good uh, um, a memory. And uh, it wasn't until last night that I kind of realized that she's basically secret agent Hermione Granger. And uh, she's just kind of a very bookish nerd who's very self-confident, you know, is convinced that at, that at any point in time she's the smartest person in the room. And um, it made her just a whole lot of fun to write. And that, you know, she's not the sort of person who begs for your, like, attention. She's pretty content to sit quietly while you spill your guts to her and never bring up the fact that she's really listening very hard to everything that you're going to say and is not going to forget it. That's a perfect diplomat, too, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. That's Even if she's kind of sort of a diplomat, and in truth, she's much more of a secret agent kind of person. Yeah, but, uh, but it, work, it works on both those levels. So that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, should we move to our audience questions, Veronica? Yeah, we've got a lot of them. Uh, the first one comes from Alex, who writes, RJB. What profession would you choose had you not turned out to be an author? Um, well, this is something that I thought about. Uh, I had made up my mind when I was leaving college that I wanted to be a writer. And um, I had in my mind this grand sentimental uh, idea of what it was like to be a poor writer, very Chuck Bukowski kind of getting drunk and you know being a filthy dude. And then I realized pretty quickly that that's a full-time job. Right. Uh, being an alcoholic is very time consuming. I don't really recommend it. And um, so I basically worked a series of incredibly crappy jobs with the intent of always writing. Looking back on it, I think that if I was going to have an alternate career, um, I would probably, this is, sounds pathetic and like a sell, I would probably want to go to law school. And uh, the reason for that is um, uh, there's a lot of things that you can do with a law degree. And there are uh, a lot of good causes out there that I think need a lot of help and need a lot of legal help. So I would probably be one of those lawyers that, that you know, I'd say, I'm a lawyer. And they'd be like, oh, are you rich? And be like, no, I work for a nonprofit. And they'd be like, no. Oh. Oh. So that's probably what I would be if I were to, uh, to, if I weren't a writer and if I were going to spend all my time on something, it would probably be, probably be something like that. Excellent. Is it because you you like to figure out the the analytics and the problem solving of the law? And I'm curious if that fits into how you write stories as well. Yeah, I like rules a lot, um, and I think that that shows up in this book. And that this is uh, a lot of the magic takes place in loopholes and finding where, like you know, in the original language, this word actually meant ice, and somehow that transferred to glass in the modern translation which is why this piece of magic actually works on glass. Um, it's that kind of hair-splitting thing and all the contradictions that I find quite fascinating. And um, I think if this shows up in the book, too, um, the word that I think of is wonk, uh, which is someone who likes policy a little bit too much for their own good. Um, a wonk is somebody that a politician hires but is never going to run for office because wonks are unelectable. They are not usually particularly charismatic people. Um, so uh, th I follow a lot of uh, uh, I follow a lot of those sorts of wonks on Twitter, and I always find that kind of fun to see those weird backroom scrums that take place with people who are just absolute nerds about these sorts of like laws and regulations. All right, we know a lot of people are going to read City of Stairs. We hope a lot more <laughs> read City of Stairs. Uh, but Steve has a very pertinent question for those who are. What music, drink, and food would best be paired with City of Stairs? Uh, the music would probably be the Shostakovich Quartets. That sounds outrageously pretentious, but um, I was, um, but um, he's one of my most favorite composers. This should give you a pretty good idea of what I was like as a kid. Um, I was raised to be a classical uh, violist. I was trained. That's what everybody thought I was going to do when I went to college. But then, wow. as it turned uh, out, yeah. There's a whole lot of time that goes into that, and there's a difference between having a talent at something, there's a difference and actually wanting to do it. And um, I could play the viola, and it made people like me, and when you're 16, there's nothing more fun than having a room clap for you. Uh, but that's not exactly something you should found a future on. But um, 
so back when I was 16, I loved Shostakovich. It's very dark, very Soviet kind of stuff. And instead of like listening to like heavy metal, I tended to listen to dreary Soviet era, <laughs> on the verge of suicide sort of classical music. So I think that that would probably I would think I think um, what is it? I think it is the third quartet, second movement that uh, comes to mind a whole lot when I'm uh, when I was. Um, I think that's it. Don't don't. Can can you hum it for us? Do you remember Do you remember how it goes? Yeah, well, it it's played on on harmonics, which is when you um when you hold your hand at the very at the very end of the string and very lightly touch the string, it makes a high pitched whine. That is the most unusual thing to do in the world, and it's very hard to do and have it sound clean. But the um, song itself goes da 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 da. Da, 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 It's, um, and hearing that on that whiny pitch is immediately, like, upsetting. You're like, I don't know if I like this. Uh, and it's a very striking piece of music. Uh, as far as drink, vodka. I'm vodka just going to say vodka. pepper vodka. Yeah, seems like yeah. a perfect thing. Yeah, I would probably go for that. And probably green tea. Very good jasmine drink too, because that's what Shara drinks. Shara it's drinks it's amazing how how you really get a sense of. I, I'm already starting to get a sense of the place and of the feeling of it just from those little bits of information. I think that's so that's so interesting. Uh, yeah. Our second question in the Steve trifecta of questions uh, today: uh, Do your political, religious, and or environmental views make their way into your writing, or do you tend to keep the two separated? And if so, why or why not? Um. For this, I think that the best answer is a quote by Anil Gaiman, where he says that he writes to find out what he thinks about things. And so, to a certain extent, you know, these things do show up in my books. Um, and usually, the characters act as the voices of parts of my mind, and that, you know, I feel this, and yet I doubt it at the same level. So it works as kind of a circle in that, you know, do you really believe that? Have you thought this through? And having that, and so I think that usually if you read my books, you're going to come away with a lot more questions than you do answers. I don't know if that's a satisfying reading experience. Uh, but I think that I can't help but uh, have those things come through, probably for this book more than others, because it's, it, cause it's about spies and countries, so it has a lot to do with politics. Mm -hmm. So even if it's foreign politics, I find the idea of trying to look at power and how, how people use it to be pretty satisfying. <clears throat> and I think that um, when you see it happening outside your door and on the news in your own country, you tend to be a little bit blind to it and realize that some of the actions that are happening nowadays are the exact same things that have happened for thousands and thousands of years. And once you realize that, um, you stop being surprised. I feel like it would be impossible for any author to entirely separate their own views from their writing. I, 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 that would almost be a bad idea because it goes against write what you know, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I guess this question is often asked as if, do you have an axe to grind or you're trying to force your views down my throat? It sounds like you're saying no, that you're actually, and I love that answer of Neil Gaiman's, like I'm actually trying to figure out what I think. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't think that I, I mean, I might come to a strong conclusion on certain things in that book, but um, <clears throat> it's not saying, and on Bill 376C, you need to vote. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the appendix, it gives you a voting guide. Yeah, uh, and we promised you three questions from Steve. Here's the third. He says it's difficult to nail down where your books should reside in a bookstore. Uh, where should they be placed when they finally name a genre after you? What will it be called? Um, uh, I always thought I was a fantasy writer, and uh, when I first got published, uh, I assumed that I'd be a fantasy writer, and they said that they were going to do me as horror. I was like, you know, there's nothing else I'm going to write. It's going to be horror. Um, but they, you know, but the idea was that horror was about to change significantly. It was going to become broader and do this big thing, and that didn't quite happen. Uh, so now I'm back with the fantasy section. Uh, I feel like if they were going to name a section, it would. Uh, I'm hoping that I would just wind up in the section for best selling or successful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, that is oh. perfect. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's oh, yeah. great. 
<laughs> I like it. All right, our next question comes from Caleb, and I had to do a little bit of digging to uh, understand exactly what this question was all about. Um, he says, uh, will you ever publish a sexual experience? Uh, my life will be meaningless if I can never read it. Um, a little background, please. Yeah, um, back in 2011, at the end of 2011, um, I was kind of bored and trying to figure out, you know, how to do some fun. Motion. Uh, 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 and one of the things that I don't like about uh, up the internet is that people think that um, reaching out to the author will somehow make the books a richer experience. That knowing me personally, and knowing, you know, that I'm playing with my son, and that I drink this cup of beer, and that I don't like this television show will make you like my books more. But I, I don't think that that's true. I think that that's actually somewhat hurtful to the experience. Um, and one of the things that I like to do is um, use my, my online profile to defy you and do the things that you probably don't want to see in your timeline or on YouTube. And uh, what things that you don't want to see me doing and that aren't me. And so um, I started thinking about like just the stupidest book thing that I could do. And it was the idea of writing an erotic romance called A Sexual Experience, which was, you know, is up there for the shittiest, uh, the worst names of, uh, any, um, of any romance or book ever. You know, it just describes in <laughs> the most unromantic language what you're about to read. And so That's what it says on the tin. Yeah. It just, yeah, what do you think it's going to be? And so I was, uh, once again, just doing laundry, hanging out, and I was kind of just fooling around in my head. And then suddenly, like I, like I wrote a script, and, I, um, and my friend is a filmmaker. So I sent it to him, and I was like, you want to do this? And I think we filmed that thing at about 25 minutes in my living room. Nice. Uh, bought a backdrop, bought a pedestal from Garden Center. And my wife made me give that thing right back like one hour later. Um, and uh, I think I'm wearing shorts. You don't ever see it. But, uh, but it, <laughs> and uh, it was just fun because, you know, it was meant to be bad, so we didn't really have to try. And uh, right away, all my friends were like, well, you know, like, they were, they were like uh, 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 their own writers, so they were like, why did you do that? And I was like, this is funny. And um, I remember that that hit the Internet the day before the editor when all of a sudden there was a chance that, you know, like, people might be talking about me. This guy's up for an award. Let's check out his career. What the hell is this? And seeing this and being like, I don't understand what I'm seeing right now on the internet. <laughs> and um, so I guess to a certain extent it's just a big practical joke played on people who might want to read my books. Nice. Uh, um, it had a little bit of a wolf gore feel to it. Are you familiar with wolf gore? I'm afraid I'm not. Okay, he's a, he's a YouTuber, and uh, the, little, the little rose... Like the tap 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 at the end, and and the uh, the flashing, like the subliminal flashing that happens also. It's yeah. a it, it's you know I think a lot of YouTubers do it because it it's it's very weird. It's almost uh, Tim and Eric awesome show style. Also, there's a lot of that in there too. That um, was I, yeah, I dug it dug it very much. I found it I found it uh, very interesting that when Veronica sent me the link to watch it, I was not wearing socks already. Sure. Uh, which, yeah, which I, I was, I didn't even know that I was prepared. And Veronica said that she was actually in the act of removing her socks when she was watching. I was in the process of taking off my socks, and then there was a sock line about taking off your socks, and my mind, my brain just exploded. That is my son in uh, in the costume, by the way. <laughs> really? <laughs> I thought it was just stock photography. That's hilarious. Well, yeah. You know, that costume did. <laughs> That's. It's a family affair. I love it. Right. Uh, Aiden wanted to let you know, uh, to, or actually thank you, for the live performance of a sexual experience at LunCon 3. Uh, Aiden says it was a special moment in his life. Uh, but then he says, just kidding, which I think is kind of mean. No, he yeah. said no. He was saying just kidding to not having a question. He oh, has a question. He, I see. Said, no question. Uh, I just wanted to thank you. Right, it's not, okay, but he does have a question. Uh, I know you've been a bit surprised at the overwhelmingly positive reaction to Sigurd. How did you first discover him, and how did he change over the course of writing the novel? Um, when I was writing this, and I knew that I wanted to write Shara, um, I realized that I needed to have somebody to bounce off of her or for her to bounce off of. She's a very thoughtful, cerebral person, thinking things through, knows about the history, and she cares a lot. 
So I thought it would be great to have her stuck with this gigantic person who um, did not care and was not going to be roused to care and was basically only there to stab things and to do a very good job of it. Uh, and um, that kind of stuck in my head for a bit, and then suddenly I was like, let's just like, just write in Beowulf. Just throw him into this story and see what happens. And so I did. And it's pretty obvious. To, I mean, I think that a few people have said, like, this is Beowulf, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, basically. Uh, but uh, he's... Uh, I, people seem to absolutely love him because uh, to a certain extent he's, like, satire. And that, um, you know, in most fantasy books there's just this awesome dude who's just very unusually good at things and just too cool. Uh, he's that times a thousand. Um, uh, I, I think that a few people have said he's like uh, he's like the Brock Samson of this book, and that's not mm. a, 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 a comparison. And it, it was right around then um, uh, that um, my wife was out of town a whole lot, and whenever that happens, I tend to drink a whole lot of beer and watch uh, films on Netflix. And one of them that I watched was Valhalla Rising, the same guy who did Drive. So it's like this hyper gritty, artsy, macho stuff, and it's got uh, Mads Mikkelsen uh, doing the most horrific violence that you have ever seen on on film, covered in mud. Everything's grim and so dark, and you know he's got one eye. And I was like, all right, I, I think I know what to do with this. And it was kind of fun because he's he's very funny in the book because. You know, everything's so important, and, and there's all these deep history, and he's like, I'm not even... So, he was very entertaining. Really. Excellent. All right, now we have a... a, 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 a what, what, what would I call this? A, a duple of questions from a, tr a, a double, double question stack from Griffin? A twofer. Um, a twofer. Thank you. He says... Robert, will you continue with more novels set in the world of City of Stairs? This is where you say, yes, Griffin, I will, because I don't want to disappoint Griffin, who is awesome, if tasteless. Also, why did I lose myself in your lovely eyes? Seriously, I want to find my way back, but it's impossible to find the door in this brown study. Okay. I feel um, like that's a lot of uh, maybe insidery Griffin jokes, perhaps? Uh, not, not really. Um... Uh, but um, I actually am writing a sequel, uh, and it features one of the characters um, that was a lot of fun to write. Her and, and uh, 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 Sigrid as they go to the city that was once uh, the land of the goddess of war and death. Uh, on, you know, like the plot of this book. And um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Julian Mulagesh is her name. Uh, and she was a lot of fun to write in that... Um, uh, when I first wrote her character in the book, she was going to be the local, uh, like, official. She was, like, part of the military. She's part of the government. And I was going to make her an older man because I wanted to have, like, Shara work on him and, like, like kind of, like, surprise him, impress him. And I was like, that's kind of fun. And then I was like, this feels like a trope and it's not that interesting. I don't know if I want to do it. And then suddenly I was like, let's make her a woman. Make her, like, 50 years old and really tough and just not willing to tolerate any of this bullshit. And then suddenly, she started to really work. And then uh, I really started to like her scenes quite a bit. And then um, when I started to think about a sequel, I was like, you know, well, I can't say exactly how things end. But um, I, I, like I realized, I was like, who's left to work with? And she came right to the top of the So, uh, and I'm writing that right now, and it's a, tr and it's a whole lot of fun. Um, and it'll be longer, too. I know a lot of people were surprised that this is a fantasy novel that's only about 140,000 words, and a secondary world. They were like, what are you doing? This is totally not allowed. It's supposed to be 18 pounds and causing hernias. Uh, and that was my last book, uh, which was not epic fantasy. Uh, but um, this one, I might cue closer to that stand. Uh, oh, actually, actually Griff Griffin's other question... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um... Like I was going to say that I have no idea why he's lost in my eyes. That sounds like his problem. He needs to work that out. It says, it's, it's in quotes. Why did I lose myself in your lovely eyes? Oh, yeah. well, I don't know. I don't know. I, but I was not aware that my eyes had had that effect. But <laughs> <laughs> They're capacious. That's why. 
patience. It, it's the light. Uh, Griffin's other question is, why the shift into more immediately recognizable fantasy from your earlier work? Because I wanted to. Oh, it just seemed fun. Um, when I, the way that I think about this book is that it, uh, it's swashbuckling. You know, there's scenes where someone jumps on top of something and holds their sword out and yells and then jumps off of that thing. That's the element of swashbuckling. And uh, so uh, it's got that sense to it. It's got a sense of adventure and fun and zip to it. It's, it's a really fun book. And uh, I just found myself wanting to write something with that sort of gusto to it. Awesome. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, City of Stairs was out on September 9th, so people can grab it all over the place now, right? That's correct. Fantastic. And I hope you all will go out and do so. I'm excited to read it myself. Um, where can people follow your work online? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Robert J. Bennett. I've got a blog at robertbennett.com forward slash blog. Uh, and um, I'm on Facebook, too. Uh, I'm not exactly lighting it up over there, so if uh, you're ever in need for sleep, follow me on Facebook. Fantastic. And, of course, we will occasionally get some random yet awesome YouTube videos out of you, I would assume, as well. I really want to, but the schedules... I mean, like I've written, like, six scripts and sent them to these guys, but the schedules haven't worked out. Oh. So, don't worry. I'm always wanting to embarrass myself for the message. If you ever I'm need a hand, we're good to, at embarrassing ourselves, too. Yeah, we are very good at that. I'm looking forward to another sexual experience. Well, if I can beat that last one, which I don't know if I can, I will, I will see what I can do. All right. And if you guys want to get in touch with us, our email address is feedback at Sword and Laser. Our website is swordandlaser.com. All of our discussions happen over on goodreads.com. And make sure you check out the Sword and Laser store at swordandlaser.bigcartel.com or uh, head over to the top nav over at the website uh, to get there even more quickly. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody.